This is Control Structure, episode 136, for October 26, 2017. Big week to everyone listening. This show has notes. Visit thenexus.tv slash cs136 to see them. I'm your host, Stephen Orvis, and with me is the other host, Andrew Bailey. Hi, Andrew. Arr! Arr! It's, it's past talk like a pirate day for like a month now. Oh, I should have reminded you. I'm going to talk like this ever ever until Halloween. Till Halloween, okay. It's a nice holiday to be a pirate. There you go. You can be a, be a pirate this year instead of a scientist like you were the other time. Except I don't really have a hat or a jacket or a peg leg. Uh, you have a gun? That would be a great decoration when you walk in court. Not not even a sword either. Okay, I funny story. I heard that one of the ladies at work apparently one time dressed up for Halloween. Like, like they had like a dress up day at work. Anyways, apparently she brought in her six gun <laughs> with on strapped on a belt. <laughs> so, anyways, that was I thought that was rather funny. <laughs> well, amusing anyway. So, what what kind of gun you said it was? Six gun, like a wheel gun, a revolver. Oh, revolver. Okay. Yes. Because I'm like six gun. Is that a revolver? I'm, yeah, you know, it would be a, re- a revolver. So I've, I've never heard six it. Gun. I've, I've never heard it referred to as that. Uh, apparently, it's a movie. <laughs> it, it, this it, it should be a ref- oh, Apparently, it's a game. Apparently, but it's supposed to be those. It's just that apparently that game has taken the phrase over now. Okay, well, I guess I learn a little bit more of Pittsburghese uh, every so there, every so often. Yep, yeah, yeah, that is kind of big. Pittsburghese. There we go. The definition from Webster: a six-chambered revolver. Hmm. I I thought all of them were six-chambered by like default or something. Some of them are five, and then twenty-two sometimes can be ten. It it, it depends upon the gun. Hmm. So, um, yeah, how have you been? I've been good. I've been. Uh, uh, working on my house, keeping busy with that, and uh, made tiny bits of progress, but not much overall big progress, but we'll see. Yeah, and then you showed uh, the camera with the deer. Yes. And the waving grass. And the waving grass, yes. Apparently the trail camera can see waving grass and takes a picture every time the wind blows. So I have lots and lots and lots of pictures of grass. <laughs> but I did get some pictures of deer there too, right in my front uh, driveway there that just walk up by in a big buck and everything. Yep, with the evil glowy eyes. With the evil glowy eyes, yes. Just in time for Halloween. Just in time for Halloween. So, uh, let's see. So I went over to Ohio and uh, went to the Circleville Pumpkin Show, uh, which I have done, like, what, half the time in the past ten years or so? Um, Or at least ever since I've lived over here anyway. Uh, So then uh, I had bought a uh, pizza stone and I uh, let's see mom had told me that uh, Donato's uh, so- sells frozen pizza which Donato's is like a very tasty pizza chain over in Ohio that doesn't really make it across the Pennsylvania border it did this time uh, yes uh, because I bought some and drove it over myself. <laughs> Uh, and we just had some, I threw it on the grill, so it was kind of smoky. So, yeah, and it, it is met with your approval. Yes, it is quite good pizza, and the pizza stone cooks it very nice and crisp. Yes, and, you know, we walked out there and it was just kind of like pouring out, and you could like, <laughs> smell... I thought it was burning. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and I wouldn't blame you, uh, but that, that was like the fire smoke, like, from underneath. Mm-hmm. So... Yeah, uh, it cooked very well, so yeah. Uh, I will be doing that again uh, up to four more times, because I have four more pizzas in the freezer. Uh, But uh, yeah, this podcast is brought to you by Lame 3.100, because MP3 is lame. Apparently. Yes. (laughs) Raspberry? 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 Raspberry! I guess your neighbors still aren't there. No. <laughs> um, but the the apartment is on the market. 
So I see. If if someone wants to uh, move in next to me, uh, yeah, it's there. So I think it's been on the market for like a month or so because I saw the listing on Zillow. It sat empty for so long. Yeah, since July of last year. Huh. So yeah, like way over a year. So, so it's it's on for rent or for for buying. Well, rent obviously. Oh, okay. Well, I wasn't sure if for Zillow. I wasn't sure if they rent things on Zillow or not. Oh, oh yeah. Oh, oh okay. Yeah. That's that's how I found this place. I see. And um, I was uh, in the midst of socialism with my parents. I was watching TV. You're watching TV, okay? Uh, and uh, oh, you it, don't do that. Uh, I'll I'll make exceptions for socialism, okay? <laughs> Because, you know, it's it's a socialist activity watching TV. I see. Um, like, there was, like, some uh, website advertised that was kind of like Zillow. Uh-huh. That I'm like, well, why don't you go on Zillow and see if, like, the next door is on there. And sure enough, it was. And the mom's like, I need to see, I need to see, I need to see. <laughs> so I texted her the link. And, you know, uh, like, the first picture was, like, from outside. And I'm like... That's a sweet looking grill. <laughs> <laughs> so, anyways, about Raspberry Pi. Oh, Raspberry Pis, <laughs> yes. So, apparently, uh, the Microsoft tutorial has made one about mounting a fan on your Pi, which isn't exactly a new thing, but this one, they did the thermal imaging and they realized that it is actually your. CPU that tends to burn the hottest on your Pi. I believe it was the CPU. Let's just double check. Well, system on a chip, anyway. Yeah. Anyways, uh, that burns the hottest, so they're like, let's put the fan pointing at what's the hottest. So they designed this 3D printed bracket that angles the fan just so, so it points right at that hot spot. So I thought that was nice because it's it's not a giant enclosure and it's not big and clunky. It's just a tiny bracket that you can screw onto the Pi. And it's still basically a Pi, just with a, uh, a fan on it now. So I thought that was pretty good. And I see it plugs in the GPIO pins, too. Yes. So it must be lightweight enough that it doesn't, yeah, it's uh, a five doesn't volt. Wipe, wipe out the, the Pi when you turn it on. Yeah, or equivalent 5-volt 0.2-amp DC fan. 0.2-amp, so that's pretty low then. Yeah, 200 milliamps. Yeah. So, yeah, it uh, fits right into you know the existing mounting holes on the Pi. And you can even use it with the uh, touchscreen display. I well, love how the 3D printing is kind of becoming like almost standard that you would you would have one. So so they did four tests. One just bare. Uh, one with the fan. Another with just a heat sink. And another one with the heat sink and fan. So It seems like the fan beats the heat sink. Uh, yes, just the fan alone. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, but after a while... Like, the fan temperature kind of maxes out, but the heat sink keeps going up because, like, it's not able to dissipate yep. that much. Uh, it just slows it. Yeah. Uh, although, quite a bit cooler than without. So, I mean, if if you're, like, really pegging your pie, that, uh, you know, having a heat sink would help anyway. Mm-hmm. And now for this episode's LOL Apple. So yeah, we haven't done one of these in a long time. Has it been a while? Yeah, I, I figured that uh, the Apple show would do that, but at least for a long time there, they weren't really doing anything. But uh, uh, yeah, uh, so iOS 11, which is like the latest release of like the iPhone operating system and uh, also iPads, uh, has been released, and the built-in calculator app has a severe problem. Especially when you try to add uh, three numbers together uh, in like quick succession, and I would imagine uh, doing any two or three operations in quick su- succession would uh, also trigger this. Uh, so apparently, there's like fancy animations in all the buttons, and while the animation is going on, like no further key presses uh, will be recognized. Someone forgot how threading works. Uh, that, or they didn't realize that, oh, we should probably interrupt this little button animation to, uh... Because <laughs> accepting more input is more, is better than doing more fancy stuff. Yeah. And if you ask me, you know, animations are okay, but they're really not all that necessary. No. 
you know, because like, especially if like it blocks further user input, um, that kind of gets annoying after a while. Definitely. That would be super annoying. I love the answer to one of the people in this post. They're like, I, I've used the such and such calculator app since, you know, however long. And, oh, he says, hasn't used a stock app calculator in years. <laughs> so it's just like the solution is, ah, we just won't use it. So, yeah, there's, there's, you know, a Reddit thread. There's tons of YouTube videos demonstrating this bug. And uh, even side by side with the older version of the calculator app. So... And I unfortunately I didn't uh, remember to put the link in the doc yet, but apparently when the original Macintosh was released, like Steve Jobs, that like the calculator app was Steve Jobs's baby. Oh really? Yeah. So I imagine if he were still around, uh, like someone put in a comment that uh, if Steve were still around, he would gather everyone even remotely involved with this app into one room yell at all of them, and fire them on the spot. wonder why he liked the calculator that much. I imagine because it was back in the early 80s that, you know, like, actually a calculator was kind of a big thing. That's probably true. I know in the... Like, back then, people looked at computers as, like, big calculators. <laughs> so, obviously, you should have a calculator in your operating system because it's a big calculator, I guess. I remember back in college... I wrote they one of the projects was a calculator program and when I wrote it I always had some problems with like the numbers overflowing or something like that <laughs> because you know the, in 32 and I remember that the teacher was showing me the bug he's like yeah it overflows when you when you do this but he's like it's okay the windows calculator does that too <laughs> it was like the windows 98 one or something like that I remember I went and tested it and it did it would it would flow over when you when you added two bigger numbers together well, or something like that. Well, I got some Windows 98 right there. There we, we go. Can try. We, we, could, we could try it later <laughs> and see if my memory's right. <laughs> um, although, uh, at least when if you had that uh, really bad Pentium CPU with that floating point division bug, it would be exposed through Windows Calculator. So, like, I'll probably link to that uh, later. But uh, anyways, speaking of uh, low-powered systems... Uh, let's talk about Rockbox for a minute. Uh, Rockbox is a custom firmware for MP3 players uh, that essentially kind of like redoes everything and adds like a lot more options and features and flexibility. Uh, I recently noticed that 3.14 uh, was released uh, a while back, like several months ago. So I like totally missed out on this. Um, but the... Uh, so along with, you know, supporting a few more devices and better, uh, the big thing is that, uh, at least for me, is remember that Opus uh, format? Is that the one you had like this triangle MP3 player that you got from like a Kickstarter? No. 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 Okay. Uh, the Opus format is essentially like an ever better lossy uh, sound format. Okay. So like MP3, but on steroids. Uh, like I think we might have talked about this a few months ago that they released a version that is like twice as efficient in space as MP3. So uh, like I had tried uh, playing Opus on my player before with the previous version of Rockbox, uh, but this uh, new version has like a uh, like a bunch of fixes around that and uh, makes the playback like a little bit more efficient and costs less CPU and everything. So I put that on here, and I can actually use Opus on my player now. There you go. So now I can stuff more music onto here. That's a big deal. We have a small player, and yeah. uh, you can fit tr twice as much stuff on it. Uh, but I have 30, uh, 32 gig micro SD card. So you probably had infinite storage already anyways. Uh, not infinite, but uh, definitely quite a bit. Mostly infinite. Okay. Um, so let's see. I forget what exactly, uh, yeah, improved parsing, seeking, and performance when decoding Opus files. So that's, like, the big thing for me. Um, so I uh, did did some uh, experiments. Uh, 64 kilobit Opus files sound pretty good. Uh, and, like, I played at least 50 or so on this. So I'm pretty confident that it doesn't crash because, like, it didn't on any of those. Um, 
but even at 64k, I think I can hear a little bit of muffling, so I think I'll do 96k from now on. If you're getting a good space savings, then the, the little extra shouldn't hurt too much. Yeah, because I think I was using like 150 to 200k before uh, on most files, so like, and some of them were like even more. Uh, because they were like encoded mp3 at like 320 so like even they're like three times the space saving so uh, speaking of uh, well I guess this really wouldn't be uh, embedded uh, but uh, apparently Wi-Fi is uh, not as secure as we once thought uh, at least some implementations so WPA2 is like the recommended security protocol for Wi-Fi uh, so that has been, uh, like a huge flaw has been found in multiple client Wi-Fi implementations and devices. Uh, so it involves the handshake. It's, it's an attack on the handshake. Uh, so, you know, when you, whenever you do a, you know, like set it, set up some secure encrypted channel, you need to like talk back and forth a few times. So this involves four messages for WPA2, and it has been found that if you can somehow block message three, or at least cause it to like resend a few times, mm -hmm. that it will reset the key and the like number you're only supposed to use once. So was I misinterpreting wrong? For some reason, I was thinking all they had to do was replay that handshake a couple of times, and then the. The, what you're connecting to would reset things. Yeah. So, like, if you can kind of know what data is being sent over, you can, like, by resetting the keys and stuff a yeah. few times. It says this is achieved by manipulating and replaying cryptographic handshake messages. Yeah. So it is replaying them. Yeah. All right. So we show that an attacker can force these nonce resets by collecting and replaying retransmissions of message three of the four-way handshake. By forcing nonce reuse in this manner, the encryption protocol can be attacked. That is, packets can be replayed, decrypted, and or forged. The same technique can also be used to attack the group key, peer key, TDLS, and fast BSS transition handshakes. So... Uh, and then it goes on to practical attacks. As a result, the same encryption key is used with the nonce values that have already been used in the past. So this, in turn, this causes encryption protocols of WPA2 to reuse the same key stream when encrypting packets. In case a message that reuses the key stream, key stream has a known content, it becomes trivial to derive the used key stream. So, yeah, this is kind of a severe attack and kind of nullifies the uh, over-the-air encryption. So, uh, it looks like Windows uh, didn't really implement that reset quite right. So, <laughs> it's invulnerable to this. <laughs> Saying, score! <laughs> we didn't do it right, so we escaped the bug. Yeah. Um, sometimes a broken clock is twice, is right twice a day. You're, that's absolutely right. <laughs> um, so this especially affects, uh, WPA supplicant, which is the Wi-Fi client that Linux uses. Linux, huh? Why is this relevant? Because if you dig deep enough in, into Android, you find Linux. That is quite true. So, like, pretty much all of these phones, uh, you know, the, most of the phones uh, out there are uh, susceptible to this. Interestingly enough, this does not not really apply to, like, routers and base stations, uh, although it does affect any kind of repeater because they need to, like, forward on the signal. So if I was understanding, is it the, the client or is it this the, uh, the one you're connecting to that is allowing this attack to happen? The client. Okay. Because the, so the client, client resets when it hears the handshake happening and is like, oh, I'll, I'll, I'll reset. Yes. Hmm. So uh, apparently the researcher found that like some variants affect like pretty much all operating systems. But like apparently the Windows one had a bug, so it's not affected by like everything. <laughs> so...
So, speaking of uh, Linux, uh, Ubuntu 17.10 has been released. It says in April, though, doesn't it, in, of 2018? That's when the 18.4 comes out. Oh, uh, okay. I was I was misreading and misunderstanding. So, 2018, that's 18.4 April. Okay. So, that's pretty much how uh, Ubuntu has always done their versioning. I Last see. two digits of the year, point month. So... Uh, anywho, uh, speaking of, that uh, release next year uh, is going to be the long-term support release, uh, and they're also uh, getting rid of uh, uh, Unity and every and that, and, and Mirror, that's it, the other thing. So, uh, but that's like, for, that's going to be like big news for the long-term release. But in between, there's like these sort of smaller releases and, that, and that's what this uh, 17.10 is. And in preparation, it uh, has, it by default, will have the GNOME interface with the Wayland display uh, server or whatever it's called now. So, uh, you know, you, you know how, how much of a pain x.org is? It's very frustrating when it doesn't work right. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So, like, without x.org, you don't have any, uh, you know, graphical user interfaces or anything. Uh, Wayland replaces that. And, uh, you know, it's been sort of designed to sort of, like, you know, ignore or design around the uh, flaws in x.org. So, and for the past, like, five-ish years, uh, Ubuntu has decided to, you know, scrap that but do their own uh, display server called Mir, uh, along with uh, Unity uh, for the uh, you know the user interface. But uh, you've been using GNOME on Ubuntu for quite a while due to the uh, uh, was it that 3D printer program? Yes, Cura. There's apparently well, Cura said it wasn't them, but some bug someplace meant that Cura did not play nicely with release the latest great and greatest version of Cura didn't play nicely with. Unity, and so the recommendation was don't use Unity, use GNOME. And so I switched, and it actually wasn't bad. That was back when this must have been the the get ready for GNOME switch up when they ins would install both at the same time, and you can kind of switch between Unity and GNOME at login. And uh, I had done that and just started logging into GNOME, and you know what? It's basically the same anyways from a user perspective. Yeah, so apparently they also uh, have a new on-screen keyboard in this release. And uh, apparently, by default, it is a swap file instead of a swap partition. Swap file, okay. Yes. Uh, which you know has been a feature of Linux for quite some time, but apparently, I guess it's now the default. And uh, also features kernel four point one three. So looking forward, uh, Mark Shuttleworth, the Ubuntu guy, uh, you know, is you know looking forward to you know having like a long-term release with, you know, the new GNOME interface and everything, and he's, you know, kind of like all gung-ho and excited about it to, you know, get down to work and develop this. Uh, so the 18.04 release is going to be called Bionic Beaver. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, this uh, 1710 is uh, Artful Aardvark. So, you know, continuing along with the adjective animal theme mm -hmm. with you know the alliteration there it's interesting just i'm reading through his uh, paragraphs there and uh he's he's talking about kubernetes and uh i saw had a hoop in there and all all, all club things yeah being being very important to know um i'm really disappointed that they didn't call the v release vulgar vulture <laughs> <laughs> You know, like, if if I ever tell anyone to, you know, try out Ubuntu, like, I'll tell them to, it's like, yeah, go to Ubuntu.org and download Vulgar Vulture or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> so, but uh, you might want to install Ubuntu on, uh, well, uh, VirtualBox. I guess I'm, I guess my tabs are kind of mixed up. Uh, VirtualBox 5.2 uh, is now available. And uh, I just installed this just before the podcast, and they changed the icons. Ooh, they made made pretty gooey changes, so we all know they got a code update underneath the hood, right? <laughs> uh, knowing Oracle, probably not. 
Um, so apparently they uh, have a new virtual machine format, the Oracle Cloud Infrastructure Classic format. I guess they have some kind of newer one going on, but uh, I guess the Oracle Cloud isn't really doing too well these days. Um, automatic Unintended Guest OS installations uh, for virtual machines. Uh, let's see. Yeah, improved virtual machine tools, icons, blah, blah, blah. Uh, audio device enumeration support for audio backends. Uh, support for Q and bin images as CD and DVD media, including multiple tracks. So, uh, like, I have a few uh, formats, like IS, you know, like disk images in that format. So, like, I guess this might be useful for, like, preservation, I guess. But uh, you might also want to uh, put Windows 10 in a virtual box. Uh, or you might just like run it right on the bare hardware like I do. Uh, so we've talked about the uh, the Linux subsystem in Windows, uh, and apparently that's getting a kind of a major overhaul, uh, being that it's like being brought out of like a beta release or like a developer mode kind of thing. So uh, also like it's going to be exposed a lot better in the Windows Store. So you got, uh, you know, you got your Ubuntu, of course, you got your OpenSUSE, and uh, let's see, I thought they had three distributions, but I'm pretty I... sure they do is Fedora. Did we talk about that? Uh, let's see. It only has uh, OpenSUSE Leap and Open and SUSE Linux Enterprise Server. I was just thinking this is, uh, Fedora is listed as, oh, will arrive in the store in coming months. So uh, Fedora is on this way. Uh, I was thinking this is a pretty big hit for uh, developers that use Linux as their development platform because then you can sit there and hack away the keyboard and have a nice place to install things because quite often it's very painful with some of those those Linux things to install them on Windows and with the weird dependencies and things. So that that's a nice thing. I did notice that they said that this isn't ideal for a uh, server for hosting a Linux app. Like they said, it does work the Windows server. But that that it wasn't really ideal under load, and they said that the Dockerized containers were still better for that. Yeah. Um, so apparently they are going to they are trying to depreciate the name Bash on Windows, and instead use uh, Windows uh, subsystem for Linux instead. It sounds fancier. Bash on Windows sounds like what we already have is the the the. C W N Sigwin Sigwin how yeah. do you pronounce it? That's what that sounds like. Whereas that the subsystem sounds a little more more in depth and and probing and personal. Yeah, you know, it's it's just kind of the corporate speak that Microsoft you know uses continually. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm I'm really surprised they didn't try to name this after a Halo character. So um, or at least like out of, or at least uh, like a code name out of a game or something, because you got the Redstone update, which I think might have been the anniversary edition. Uh, you got Cortana, which is you know the voice assistant, which is like the uh, AI from Halo. Oh really? Okay. Yeah, and there's like a uh, like a few more things, but those are like the two I can think of right now. But uh, yeah. <laughs> Uh, also, one thing I want to do is write backup scripts in Bash uh, so I can run it in this Bash on Windows <laughs> so I can use my backups, you know, with uh, rsync and like a direct SSH yeah. connection. Speaking about Microsoft, um, remember, uh, so along with the gaming stuff, remember Connect? Connect Big was... Connect was supposed to be this amazing uh, depth sensing camera uh, that like was actually produced. So like this was like maybe f six years ago or seven years ago apparently uh, since this debut in 2010. Uh, so you know initially this was like an add-on to the Xbox 360. So you could essentially like grab a tennis racket that you actually use to play tennis with and start swinging it around in your house 
so you can play virtual tennis. Did did it come with uh, straps to attach to your tennis racket so you didn't hit your TV? No. <laughs> I guess, you know, they were confident enough that if you, say, had a tennis racket and was using it, like, normally, you would have learned to not, like, let it, you know, slip out of your hand. <laughs> um, so, yeah. Uh, so, along with... Uh, you know the Xbox One. They, you know, along with the, the always-on internet connection, they uh, delivered the, you know, the new Connect along with the Xbox One. So like you could just like step into the room and log you on to your system. Um, but throughout all of this, one of the problems that they had is that you kind of need a big room in order to run it well. So, for instance, the room we have that we're in right now, I don't think would be big enough. So, uh, after a while, like, they were kind of, uh, you know, the customer base uh, and the prospective customers, like, were kind of up in arms about this being, like, a mandatory thing and uh, arguably kind of uh, slowed down the sales of the system. So... They re-engineered it to, like, be optional, and that uh, let them sell a lot more units. And unfortunately, the software for it never quite materialized. So, uh, you know, like, you know, it just kind of became an ostracized thing. You know, it turns out that gaming is not a really big use for a depth-sensing camera. So... Uh, you know, this does not mean that we'll never see anything like this again, because like this iPhone 10 essentially has a depth sen sensing camera on it. Mm -hmm. So, you know, again, it's like supposed to like log you into your phone and stuff. So, uh, and also I think there is something called Windows Hello, which, you know, essentially embeds a depth sensing camera into laptops. I see. So, so they've taken the technology and, and, and used it as just the wasn't the right application this time yeah so you know this kind of defeats the hold a picture up to the webcam and log in someone so like with a depth sensing camera it'll be like hey that's a flat piece of paper that's not a person's face <laughs> <laughs> so uh yeah speaking of uh gaming uh i've talked about humble bundle a few times so apparently they've just been bought by IGN, which is kind of like a game review site and like a game news site. So like this has been a little bit controversial because now a game uh, review site is now like selling games. And not only that, uh, Humble Bundle has started to publish games as well. I thought a lot of what Humble Bundle did is they often had like charities where they would give a certain percentage to some some place or something. Yeah, that's that's the uh, one of the selling points, I guess you could say, uh, of hum humble of Humble Bundle. Um, so yeah, I think you know the mood is definitely mixed. You know, uh, hopefully with this they will be able to like secure better deals or something. So, like, you can get, like, you know, like, a better games in the bundles. And, you know, like, there's also the uh, Humble Store along with that. And also, like, a monthly subscription thing to, like, pay, like, ten bucks mm -hmm. a month and, like, get, like, a nice game. So, That's actually how I got my copy of ARC was you sign up for the subscription, bought ARC, or got it the next month or something, and canceled the subscription. <laughs> so, let's talk about uh, storage for uh, a moment. Talk about Western Digital. So, uh, like, we all basically know the, uh, like, how a hard drive operates, right? There's, you know, like, disks coded in magnetic material that a head sweeps over to magnetically charge the disk in order to store data. So, at this point, the, what are called magnetic domains, which is, like, the smallest unit that can be like flipped uh, polarity uh, has you know gotten to a point where you know it's it's kind of easy to accident accidentally flip them. So one of the techniques that uh, companies are looking into is trying to 
temporarily reduce the uh, coercitivity of these little magnetic domains just enough to write to them and then undo that process such that it'll remain that way. So the uh, what's been uh, looked at intensively for the past few years is heat-assisted magnetic recording uh, was thought to be the next big thing in that uh, magnetic, or no, not magnetic, microwave-assisted magnetic recording was thought to be a long shot, but Western Digital has come out of nowhere and said, hey, we perfected magnetically, uh, was it, why do I keep on saying that? That's the second M. <laughs> it's microwave-assisted magnetic recording. Uh, like, apparently, they've made some kind of breakthrough. And essentially, uh, it involves, like, the shape of the head that's being used. Uh, that they can apparently embed, like, a little microwave laser onto there. So, like, they have, like, this little microwave beam in, like, the middle of their head. Uh, so... Uh, you know, like whatever sector or magnetic domain or what have you is underneath, like it'll be zapped while it's within the magnetic field of the read and write head. So I wonder if that's what kind of impact this can have on the long term life of that head, the, the disc, because that's going to be a lot of heat and stress if you're writing all the time. So that was one of the uh, potential pitfalls of the heat assisted one. In that, like, you're literally putting heat down onto the platter and you're, like, messing with heat in very small mm -hmm. kind of places. But with microwaves, that's not the case. That apparently it operates at a much lower temperature. So, you know, you won't, uh, you know, your hard drive won't be dinging whenever your uh, files are done. <laughs> 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 Ding! <laughs> beep, beep! <laughs> Files are done. <laughs> uh, yeah, that 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 was a pretty good uh, joke there. <laughs> so the Mozilla Developer Network is now kind of the sorta of official repository for web technology, uh, like for web technology documentation, after Microsoft, Google, Samsung, and even the W three C. Uh, ha have agreed to start using the MDN for, you know, like documentation and, you know, like explaining what all of the JavaScript APIs and such do. So what browser technologies does Samson make that they're in on this? I think they're, it's mostly involved with uh, cell phones. Okay. Uh, so like, like embedded browsers, maybe? Yeah. Um... Let's see, I'm not sure if it has anything much to do with uh, Tizen, which is kind of like their sort of knockoff Android system uh -huh. that they use for, like, TVs. I'm not sure if they're going to make the jump over to cell phones because, like, Android is, like, so big. So in the March forward, we need to say goodbye to Firebug next month with Firefox 57. It seems that most, if not all, of the Firebug features are now built into the Firefox development tools. So, you know, this is kind of like a look back at, uh, you know, Firebug and how that improved, you know, like not only itself, but also the uh, web itself. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, it's like, oh, you can go in and look at the network requests and you can, you know, uh, modify the uh, DOM like right there, like inside the browser. So you essentially, this is essentially like God mode of the browser. So, uh, you know, but now you can pretty much do this with any browser's development mm -hmm. tools. Um, so, yeah, it's been great. So speaking of, I'm now prepared for the future because I've stopped using all of my legacy Firefox extensions, which I was only using like maybe six or seven or so. Like, I'm not one of those people who has, like, 400 extensions. <laughs> uh, one to do everything, including making coffee. <laughs> and, like, and like I don't even have, like, 400 tabs open at once. Because, like, some people, like, really go overboard. I don't know. I, I like having my tabs. But, like, hundreds at once? <laughs> no more than 30 or 40. I'll agree with you there. Okay. 
generally it's like less than 10 or so. See, typically for me, as I Google stuff or research things, I just keep opening tabs. And then after a while, I'm like, okay, I don't need all of these tabs at the right of these ones. Then control, kill them all. D- or control W, 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 You can w, just w. right click and close all tabs to the right. True. But I like to press uh, hotkeys a lot. Since I, can, my... I can press press the mouse button twice or I can press control W 30 times. True, but sometimes I like to see animations okay, on I my uh, plus buttons. You, you, you just like <laughs> pushing Control W because you're left-handed and you get to show it off. Yes. Go, <laughs> 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 uh, So uh, one of the big ones uh, was the uh, key pass extension that I used to fill in the password fields. So KeyPass HTTP dash connector uh, is the extension ported over from Chrome uh, that works in Firefox. It's the uh, the web extension version, so it's like fully compatible with multi-process Firefox. And now I can run my Firefox in all the processes. So um, not only that, like I've you know cleared out the old stuff, so I'm ready for Firefox 57. Uh, but I would still like an upgrade for HTTPS everywhere and no script. Tab Mix Plus would be nice, but I understand that it you know uses some Firefox specific APIs that will be going away. So you know, okay, I guess I'll uh, give that up. It was I'm not exactly sure what I was using it for. I think it was like for slightly wider tabs mm. and like some like sort of edge case tab behavior but uh yeah so yeah let's see it'll be released you know the next version of firefox will be released sometime next month nice so then after that i don't think there will be another one until like january or something so uh, along with like all this upgrading and updating and everything key pass 2.37 has been released so like i just saw this update come up and uh you know, I'm not exactly, you know, this doesn't have any kind of features that I like. I think it's more of a security and bug fix kind of thing. I think the one that made sense is it said when you made a new database, it offers to print the key pass emergency sheet, which kind of sounds like it's been there, but apparently I wasn't exactly aware of it. Hmm. So maybe that might be a nice thing if you're making one. And then it, it reminds you if you change your master key that, hey, if you print the, this file, maybe it'll be handy if you want to unlock your, your key pass someday. KeyPass now refuses to attach files that are larger than 512 megabytes. That's a pretty big attachment anyways. Yeah. What are you encrypting your whole hard drive? <laughs> uh, maybe my hard drive from 20 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, that's, uh, you know, keep on upgrading and everything. They built the MSI using Visual Studio 2017. Interesting. They're trying to be on the cutting edge. So... Um, yeah, if you'd like to submit some feedback to the show, go ahead and do so on the nexus.tv, uh, specifically right under our pretty faces on the uh, show notes page. And, uh, don't forget that today is International Backup Awareness Day, so back up all your updates. All your updates? <laughs> yes, and all your Visual Studios and your Firefox extensions. So, yeah, pretty much all you need to do is, like, back up your Firefox folder for that, I think. Probably the app data, wherever that's at. Yeah, in your... uh, User profile. Yep. So, yeah. So next week, I'm going to be going out to Kansas City again. Again? Yeah. So, uh, yeah, they really like sending me out there. So, like, I'm not sure if, like, there's some way to opt out or if they just want me to keep on going out there. Did, Did you do something last time that felt like it was useful? Not really, because, like, the, like... You know, so you're down here for, like, the entire week, right? Yes. So, like, you mentioned that there was, like, a big company meeting or something? Well, there was a meeting with one guy. It was supposed to be, but uh, ironically, he went someplace else and forgot to mention that. So <laughs> he's not showing up until tomorrow. It just didn't make sense by the time I found out. It's like, well, I can drive back Monday night, then drive back Wednesday night, or I can just sleep anyways, and yes. So, yes, it was... <laughs> I kind of kept them for no reason for a couple of days, but it's okay. Get to talk to people in the office. So now that you're going, even though you're going to be back for a few days, 
do people still stop you at like 5 30 when you're walking out and want to talk to you or something i got a phone call at four o'clock and it lasted to six o'clock last night <laughs> does that count sure so uh yeah so essentially when i whenever i go out there it's essentially for like a all hands town hall company meeting i see so and you know it's it's kind of nice to see the people out there that i sort of work with Mm -hmm. uh you know like face to face and stuff so let's see last time uh they were just getting ready to move out of their old building into a new one so uh let's see uh, let's see they were scattered on like different portions of different floors in this one office building i think it was like the first second sixth and maybe the fifth uh, like portions, like maybe like half the side of the building or something, and also like one room on the fourth floor, which, <laughs> which was kind of like the black sheep of like <laughs> put him up there. <laughs> it was like the fourth floor. No one goes to the fourth floor, huh. and which was like kind of uh, nestled in between the level three communications branch office and the McDonald's regional branch office. And, like, the thing is, like, they had, like, nice fancy glass doors and Uh stuff in the front that, like, it must have been, like, uh, panes of glass on either side. So it was just, like, one long, like, maybe, like, 15 feet of glass, uh, like, leading into the lobbies of these places. And you never see anyone in there. (laughs) <laughs> does anyone work at mcdonald's yeah that's that's what i thought like there's there was like signs on the outside saying it's like please contact like such and such next to a phone like right outside like if you if uh like the ups guy needed to do something so yeah like i've never seen anyone like inside going to or going out of those so, so i got it there's really really robots have taken over mcdonald's and, and level three and level three and and uh they just hire the, the the people that work in the branches but then it's really the robot minds that have taken over <laughs> and so that's why we get all this wonderful kangaroo and whatever else they feed us <laughs> so uh yeah they completed their move into the new place so over there they have two floors but it's all their own and I remember the CEO making such a big deal that he wanted to have an office building with the uh, company logo on the outside. So he has that now. There we go. Must be a pretty good sized company then that they can have their own dedicated dedicated yeah. building. It sounds like. Um, I don't actually. I don't think it's dedicated. We have like maybe the top two floors or something. Oh, so they have the logo, but just not uh, not the whole building. Yeah, like, okay. there we have, at l- I think, maybe a third of that. So, like, there's, like, maybe six floors, and we have two of them. Okay. So, yeah, there there's, like, the company is, like, maybe two to three hundred in that office. So, sizable. Um, so, yeah. So, I'll be out there next week. Uh and then have the podcast again, maybe the next week after that. So, um, so yeah, I went over uh, back to Ohio. Uh, so I think I may have mentioned like there's a trail there that goes like to the next three towns out. Maybe I didn't. I'm say not that. sure. So like you know, this is a trail that we've been going to like back when I was growing up. But we only made it to like maybe like five miles out or so. But it's like now I do like 20, 25 miles or so at a time. Oh, on your bike. Okay, I see. Yeah. By the way, um, it was maybe two weeks ago that I rode from downtown to Kennywood and back. Oh, wow. Yeah. That's quite a while. Yeah, it it was that one Sunday where like out of the entire week, it was like supposed to be clear, uh-huh. except for like two hours Sunday afternoon when it rained. Yes, and you were out in the rain. Well, like I was watching the forecast carefully, and it just moved enough so that I could go out on right. Okay. Um. So like for half of it, it was very lightly sprinkling. That's not too bad. Yeah. So I'm like, okay, well the rain's gonna like heavier rain is going to be moving in. So instead of like riding around on the North Shore, 
North Shore like I usually do. Let's cut out a few miles and, I don't know, like maybe go to Kennywood since it's right around the bend from uh, the waterfront. So, like, I keep on going and I must have stopped like twice or so to look down at my phone. It's like, well, like I've been going for a few miles. Where is Kennywood? Like, am I, you know, riding mm-hmm. past it? <laughs> And I think that last time, like, I started to stop, you know, I stopped and then looked around and I saw, like, the tops of roller coasters. Can you, would be harder to miss, I'm thinking. Yeah. So I saw the tops of roller coasters and I'm like, all right. There you go. <laughs> so, like, I rode a little bit further to see if, like, you could, like, go around to, like, the entryway. But, like, I didn't find any. So, uh, turns out that I rode an extra mile than I would have. If I didn't go to Kennywood, <laughs> but also did the uh, North Shore. So, so how many miles did you end up doing then? I think it was like 24 and a half or so. And that was just downtown. Okay. The ride up from the T station is a mile. And half of that is uphill. Like noticeably uphill. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm like, okay, well, I guess I'm on a roll now. So yeah, I was off of work last Wednesday uh like i took off like three days from work to like go over to uh ohio yep. but i stayed here one of them so wednesday i go out and i was like okay let's go to kennywood again so like 24 miles or so i don't think i rode three miles when i noticed my ride getting kind of rough like what's going on i look down my back tire is flat <laughs> so I'm like, oh, crap. So I, uh, you know, asked Google to get me a bus. And, I, you know, so I'm like, oh, yeah, I'm mm-hmm. riding on a bus because something failed on my bike. Uh, so I went back to the T and stuff, came, did a walk of shame <laughs> up the hill to get to my place. <laughs> walk, you know, like walking, pushing the bike in, you know, the bike tights. <laughs> So, yeah, that's kind of a walk of shame right there. Yep. Um, so n- I, I stole that terminology uh, from the guys at work. They consider, you know, like, if I don't have anything else to eat, I'll walk down to Subway. Oh, I that's see. That's their walk of shame. I see. Um, so, uh, you know, went down, dropped off the bike at the bike shop, and they said, like, it wouldn't be until, like, Tuesday or mm-hmm. Wednesday uh, to get the bike back. Uh, so I'm like, okay. And then, you know, I, you know, went off to Ohio. Uh, I think, yeah, it was Saturday that, uh, uh, you know, me and dad went back to that trail and, uh, you know, started riding. And, you know, of course, uh, you know, I left the old man in the dust pretty much immediately. You Um, didn't wait for him since you were riding together. mm, He didn't, he has a pair of bike pants. But he did not have them on, and he's like, oh, I'm just, like, going out there for a little ride or whatever. It's like, well, I'm going to do a lot, like, two hours or so. Okay, I see. So, uh, so I, you know, went on for, like, you know, 10, 11 miles or so, and, uh, so, like, there's Mount Vernon, which is, like, the town where it starts. Then, like, the next town is Gambier. Then the next one is Howard. Like, I've never I never actually made it to Howard before. Uh, I think the last time I was on the trail, I only went to... Only went eight miles out, and then, uh, you know, eight miles back. So I'm like, okay, well, why don't we go further? Like, maybe, like, 11 or 12 miles. So, and, uh, yeah, the trail goes east. East. There. So we're starting at Mount Vernon. Oh, you said Game... Game Bearer? Gambier. Uh, Gambier. And then, or uh, uh, it's the Kokosing Gap Trail. I think that's what it's called. Like it should like highlight it, right? Uh, Does it have a place? If I just type that in, you're thinking? Yeah, like it. I don't know how to spell that. Ko Ko Sing. Sing. Thank you. I I could spell that. I uh, believe it's yep. Okay. Oh, there it is. Uh, yeah, that's the one in Gambier. So. Uh, so yeah, I went uh, you know to twelve miles or so past uh, Howard, and I'm like, how long is this trail? You know, because uh, like the next town was uh, Danville, and uh, so I'm like, it's I don't think it's like too far, but like I wonder how long this trail is. 
So, because I'm like, someday I'm going to come back here and I'm going to ride this stupid trail end to end and back. So, you know, I stopped and, you know, pulled out my phone and suddenly someday became that day. (laughs) (laughs) So, so it was like only like another two or so miles from there. So I'm like, just do it. (laughs) Yeah, for two more miles, that's not very far to keep on writing so uh when i turned around uh dad said he had stopped at uh gambier and mm-hmm. uh was like in front of the uh, train there so i get back there he's still there and he and uh then he's like uh my tire's flat <laughs> oh his tire went flat yeah so it happened to both of you so uh yeah, we uh, before we left, he uh, had like filled up the tires and stuff, and mm-hmm. I I had checked the pressure, and the one that popped was like sort of almost I think maybe a little bit over pressure, so I had to okay. I had to let some air out, but it apparently popped anyway. Hmm. Like it was you know it seemed to be a good pressure, but still, um, and then you know I rode all the way you know back to the beginning and stuff, so yeah. I've heard of uh, really serious bikers who have like a spare inner tube and a mini bike pump in their backpack. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I called my uh, brother up, you know, later uh, because like I was uh, uh, before I had, uh, you know, come back. Uh, and he's like, well, you have some uh, pockets there. Just carry a like a spare tube with you or something. Um, and uh, I'm like, I've been riding for like a year and a half. And this is the first time this has happened. You know, like, it's not that big a deal. You know, like, around here, there's plenty of buses, so... That's true. If you have buses around, it's not too bad. If you're out riding, like, other LSD trails and you're 20 miles up, now you have to walk 20 miles back. <laughs> it's less of a big deal. <laughs> or it's so, more of a big deal, not yeah, less. But yeah. yeah. So, uh, and then, uh... Apparently, the day I was at the pumpkin show, the bike shop called me and said my bike was done. Like, I didn't think they would get to it for mm-hmm. another four days or something. So, you know, I come back here uh, for, like, a few minutes. Uh, like, I drive back on Sunday. Okay. You know, uh, uh, like, unpack for a few minutes, then go down to the uh, bike shop, then go directly downtown to uh, ride around. Uh, and I, I finally went to Kennywood again. So, yeah, that was a nice long ride there. Um, let's see. And oh yeah, it was, uh, yeah, last Sunday, yeah, that was the Bengals game. I didn't watch it. What happened? Uh, apparently the Steelers slaughtered them. Oh really? Okay, so, good for them. So, like, because this was the afternoon at South Hills Village, like, people were already coming in and parking at the uh, park and ride to ride the T downtown. Oh, it was the game in Pittsburgh? Yeah. Okay. So... Uh, despite being from Cincinnati, this one couple were Steelers fans. <laughs> so, like, uh, I uh, had a nice conversation with them and stuff. So, yeah. Um, apparently the guy had a friend that lives here. And initially he would drive to the games. And the guy from Cincinnati is like, no, you need to take the tea. Just, like, try it once. You know, see if you like mm-hmm. it. And apparently the next game he calls him up and he's like, you're right. He, like, <laughs> why would I ever drive again? <laughs> and the traffic's no fun down in Pittsburgh. Especially during the games. That would be horrible. Yeah. Uh, on the other, on the flip side, though, is that after games, the you have to more or less uh, stuff yourselves into the, uh, the tea cars like sardines. Because everyone's leaving right then. Yeah. Yeah. And... It was like maybe t- three or four weeks ago that I finished biking just as a game got out. So you had all kinds of traffic and yeah, like you know, like I had to carry my bike up the stairs because I think the escalator was out or something, and mm-hmm. because I wasn't disabled, I couldn't use the elevators. <laughs> like oh my leg, my leg. <laughs> <laughs> so okay, so. Uh, yeah, and then, like, I had to, like, wait an extra, like, ten minutes to, like, get on and mm-hmm. stuff. You know, I had to, like, get on, like, the first one to get on. You know, it's like, yeah, sorry, but, you know, like, how else am I supposed to do this? I've been waiting around for, like, two or three trains. Mm-hmm. So, 
yeah it was kind of a pain <laughs> so but uh yeah fun times that sounds like it so. had good fun lots of writing so uh yeah it looks looks like it'll be good enough to ride the tea the rest of the week but it's supposed to rain on this weekend and you know it's supposed to like get a little bit colder so i might have to hook it up in the basement now to ride downstairs oh okay so but who knows it might get like 75 in november it, it might like someone who works said today is like it felt kind of weird to be at but be at the pumpkin patch out there in the 81 degree weather <laughs> <laughs> so so yeah fun times so uh, have a good one. You too.